Is it time for a mind shift? If you don't know what that means, then join your host, Dr. Clint Haycock, a former evangelical Christian pastor and Bible college teacher of over 20 years, along the journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of faith, life, religion, and spirituality. I'm so happy to welcome back returning guest, Catherine Stewart, author, of course, of The Power Worshippers and The Good News Club. Thank you, Catherine, for dropping back into Mindship Podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Yes, I'm so glad that we connected again. You actually emailed me a little a little while ago about my article in the Public Research Associates, the Public Eye Journal, in which I cited you a few times. So that was a good connection to make. And a lot of other great people, Julie Ingersoll and Fred yes. Clarkson. And yeah. Yeah. So it's it kind of a community of people reporting on what the Christian right is doing. And I, of course, this was on R.J. Rashtuni, Christian Reconstructionism, Christian homeschooling, all of which you've covered in some of your articles and publications before, haven't you? That's right. Yeah. So we're talking about your article that you sent me. It's in the New Republic. It just came out in January and on 10th of January this year. It is entitled The Shock Troops of the Next Big Lie. So I'm really fascinated to talk to you about this article. So we've talked about your books, The Power Worshipers, The Good News Club, on previous episodes. You've investigated what the Christian right is doing in the USA for sure. This idea of attempting to influence Republican politics, infiltration of public schools, get Christians out in a boat and all that kind of thing. But why are you so concerned with these developments on the Christian right? I think America's religious nationalism really influences every aspect of our lives. It influences our economic policy, uh, our courts. It influences our health care system, our education system. But more to the point, religious nationalism is deeply anti-democratic. It's hostile to the principles of pluralism and equality upon which our democracy depends. The movement's political allies promote gerrymandering, voter suppression tactics that, you know, they're just proportionately affecting people of color and others in democratic leaning districts. And the movement is now determined to undermine the legitimacy of our electoral process, our elections. It's really attacking the foundations of our democracy. So if you value freedom of religion, if you value freedom of speech and thought, freedom from corruption, of voting mm. rights, the economic health of the American workforce, and the legitimacy of fair elections, I think you need to understand this movement and its people. Mm. Yeah, you've got some really concerning developments in your article. Well, one of the things you talk about at the beginning of the article, the seemingly charitable foundation, most people, including me, had never heard of it. It's called the James and Joan Lindsay Foundation. They're out of Montecito, California. What kind of causes does this foundation support? Because they're not just a a nice charitable organization, are they? Well, they've supported uh, David Barton's organizations like Wall Builders and something called Wall Builders Presentation for years. And if you look at their tax returns, you can see that there are multiple donations uh, to many of these types of organizations, uh, many of them in hundreds of thousands of dollars. They've donated hundreds of thousands to the Family Research Council, Focus on the Family, and a faith-based media company called Mastermind International. And uh, there's a faith-based Hollywood group that they donate to. And then they've donated lesser amounts to groups like the Council for National Policy, which is a networking group uh, for uh, movement leadership. Mm. So they're really committed. uh, They're really putting their money behind these uh, right-wing religious organizations, these Christian nationalist organizations. Right. So it's Christian nationalism. The groups that you cite in the articles, you know, you say like you talk about Family Research Council, Focus on the Family, Council for National Policy. These are more well-known, although having said that, the Council for National Policy is a very secretive group, aren't they? they? A lot of people, we don't even know who's the member of it until recently. I think some of the membership lists came out. But we don't know what they're up to. It's a lot of it is kind of done in secret, isn't it? Well, yes, but at the same time, it's not nearly as secretive as it used to be. I mean, Mm -hmm. uh, Bob McEwen, who's one of their key leaders, he's uh, given interviews, he's done podcasts. Um, They have much more public presence than they used to. And then, of course, they have uh, activist arms that are affiliated with them that um, issue policy statements that are visible. You can see, find them online. 
you know, everybody describes them as a secretive group, and it's true they mm. connect with what, um, you know, as they call it, the sort of um, the sort of right wing, uh, a, a lot of the leadership uh, of religious right organizations to big donors. But, um, you know, they're, they're, they're doing a lot more. There's a lot more sunlight on their group than there used mm-hmm. to be. It's starting to shed some light on it. Well, mm-hmm. now up to that point in the article, here I am reading this thing. I'm thinking, OK, they're right in line with people like the DeVos family, the Ooh line, some of these mega billionaires who have donated so much money to Christian right and far right organizations. But then you start talking about another group that the that the Lindsay Foundation supports. You say they've they've given them over five hundred thousand dollars just in 2019 and 2020. This organization is called Faith Wins, which is, as we find out, it's like a subsidiary or an arm of another group that they back called the Church Finds Its Voice. Now, are these the typical sort of, you know, get out the pastor, get out the vote? voter pamphlet type Christian groups that we would normally associate with, you know, organizations like this? Yeah, well, you know, the the sort of get out the pastors initiatives are are not particularly new. Faith Wins does some of what they they are the other ones do, like the groups like Watchmen on the Wall. So they target pastors with messaging about issues that matter in election cycles. And then they provide these pastors with the tools for political engagement. I attended one of their events in Virginia and it was one of a series of similar events held in dozens of churches in swing districts and swing swing states, mm-hmm. reaching thousands of pastors. And the goal of Faith Wins, like a lot of the Watchmen on the Wall events, is to persuade pastors to turn out their congregations to vote the supposedly correct way to vote their so-called biblical values. Mm-hmm. And as I said, these get out the pastors events are not new. But the thing that is um, different I think about this, like the main new thing here is that there, there was with a Faith Wins team, a so-called elections integrity expert. He was, mm. uh, he was Hogan Gidley, he used to be a member of the Trump administration. He was part of the traveling show. So he was marketed as a specialist in, in elections integrity, but his role was apparently there to spread misinformation about the 2020 election. And he and other Faith Wins speakers were not just stoking the sort of persecution narrative that's so important to the movement, but also preparing the crowd to believe that the election was fraudulent, to undermine the legitimacy of elections whose outcome they don't like. And that is now a central part of what Christian nationalist groups are doing. The movement leadership really is making every effort, as you know, to suppress votes they don't like. Um, They're supporting gerrymandering and restrictions on voting, but more than that, uh, especially in Democratic leading districts, I should say, but more mm-hmm. than that, they're calling elections whose outcome they don't like. They're saying, you know, God is on the side of Donald Trump. God is with us. And if if you're saying that, like, you know, God supports your candidate, your candidate is God's guy, and then the other guy wins, it's a way of saying, well, this election goes against God. And that mm-hmm. hits home the fact that this movement is anti-democratic to the core. I'm just looking at their site now. I don't want, I shouldn't pr- promote this site, should I? But if people do want to look this up. <laughs> I think we can't understand this movement unless we understand how it functions. And yeah. I think, you know, bringing awareness to the movement and the features of the movement is actually really important. It's quite fascinating. I just looked at it a little bit before we started this call. And the, the site is faithwins.us. That's the uh, address of the site. And it's interesting, faith, by which they mean Christian faith, it, it's going to win. It's winning. And their their sort of slogan is, Faith Wins is dedicated to educating, activating, and mobilizing faith leaders, helping them leverage their influence and impact within the government and political arena. So that's where they're at. They're, they're aiming at leaders, which, I mean, I don't haven't seen any sort of dominionist uh, language yet, but that strikes me as a very dominionist kind of uh, uh, model where you're saying we're going to go after the leaders and those are the important people to get on our side and then they can uh let's say talk about providers leader provide leaders with resources identifying church liaisons voter registration connecting with political thought leaders this is what they're up to isn't it that's absolutely you know a key player of faith wins is chad Connolly, and when they talk about reaching pastors i i can't remember the exact figure, but it's a couple of thousand pastors. You know, he had done like uh, 89 events reaching a couple thousand pastors with the potential to reach uh, nearly 200,000 voters of faith. 
So there actually, um, actually it was more than that. I, I don't remember the exact figures. I think maybe, I'm sorry, several hundred thousand voters of faith in swing districts. The, the idea is really to turn out votes in, you know, like targeting the swing district that gets the state that will, you know, tip the scales in an election season. Yeah, so what do we know about this Chad Connolly? Again, looking at their site, this is our team. And he's, I guess he's the leader of it. He's got the biggest uh, box on the site anyway. But yeah. th- one of the things that runs through all of the different uh, people that are on this Faith Wins teams is this idea is Christian nationalism because it says, you know, he's passionate about his home state of South Carolina, America and her true history. And there's that piece, isn't it, where you go, ah, they believe that the truth in air quotes about America's founding as a Christian nation has been suppressed by, you know, those that don't want the rest of us to know the truth that America really was and should be again a Christian nation. Right. Again, it's like that's pure David Barton stuff. And in fact, David Mm -hmm. Barton and his son, Tim, were part of this tour. But let's first talk about Chad Connolly. So, you know, to try to imagine that this is somehow separate from the Republican Party is ridiculous. I mean, he was the former chair of the South Carolina Republican Party. He was the director of faith engagement under Reince Priebus and the the Republican National Committee for four years. Mm -hmm. He's both a political veteran and a key player in the Christian nationalist movement. He also, again, serves on the Council for National Policy, um, that organization, uh, which, as you know, was founded by Paul Weyrich and Tim LaHaye and others at the dawn of the Reagan era, and which connects the apparatus, is the apparatus connecting the so-called doers and the donors of the Christian nationalist Mm -hmm. conservative political machine. So he's purely um, a Republican Party uh, operative and also a Christian nationalist leader. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, he, along, as you said, you know, version of history mm-hmm. promoted by David Barton. Uh, David, at the event I attended in Chantilly, Virginia, David uh, Barton couldn't speak because he apparently lost his voice. And um, so his son, Tim, was speaking in his behalf. And he did his dad proud. I mean, he delivered a, a speech that was uh, uh, Bart, very Barton-esque because there's no other way to put it. He's a Barton. <laughs> exactly. I mean, these two are really good example of how truth, fact, and evidence are utterly irrelevant to this movement. Mm. Um, David Barton's work, as you know, has been exhaustively debunked, starting from when he first started to attract attention. No one with any historical training or any claim to expertise takes his worth, work terribly seriously. And yet that has had absolutely no effect and in no way has prevented him from rising to the top of the Christian nationalist world. He really, you know, tells the story that they want to hear. What they want to hear is that the United States is a conservative Christian nation founded by Christians for Christians and properly belongs to Christians of a supposedly biblical variety. And that's that. So there's your Christian nationalist piece. Yeah, I remember talking to Dr. Warren Throckmorton, who actually co-authored a book debunking Bart, David Barton's The Jefferson Lies, you know, so that's a whole nother story right there. He claimed to have a PhD as a historian. He claimed this, that, and the other thing. You know, he's he's a complete fraudster, really, but yet yeah, that hasn't stopped him from garnering a massive following on the evangelical scene, has it? No, not at all. I mean, he uh, he's a very inter- inter- interesting character. His book, The Jefferson Lies, was actually actually withdrawn by his publisher, Thomas Nelson mm-hmm. Publishing. It's a religious publishing house. And they withdrew it because they said it lacked basis in fact. And it was the first time they'd ever withdrawn a book. But it has done nothing to diminish his standing in the movement. He's got a lot of connections. I call him um, in my book, The Power Worshippers, I call him the Where's Waldo of the movement because I don't know if any of you listening in have kids, but the, you know, Where's Waldo is a sort mm-hmm. of children's book where it's like, there he is and there he is again. Everywhere. <laughs> he's everywhere. He sits on the boards or serves as a, an advisor on so many initiatives like Project Blitz. He's one of their key leaders, um, a State Board of Education. He served as um, expert, you know, reader and consultant. Mm-hmm. Um, he's been a consultant to the uh, Republican Nationalist, uh, national, the RNC. He's worked with the American Renewal Project. In an earlier time, he served with Newt Gingrich as a co-director of a group called Renewing American Leadership. He works with the Truth and Liberty Coalition, which is an um, overtly Seven Mountains Dominionist mm-hmm. uh, initiative with Andrew Womack coming out of um, Karis Bible College. So 
you know, the thing about Barton, he's everywhere and we need to understand that his politics are really extreme. You know, on the surface, it might look like he's a political operator within the existing democratic system, but he's committed to an extreme and anti-democratic vision. So, you know, I think it's important to appreciate how uh, radical he is and his ideas are and his influence. He's indoctrinating Republican politicians in his mythical history. And he also runs political training courses for young people. Um, He's got a sort of Patriots Academy um, that people... um, sort of um, want, you know, members of the rank and file can uh, use to uh, initiate themselves in political activism. And he also has significant fundraising capability. So David Barton is a a really critical figure in this movement. I've seen him loads of times on Kenneth Copeland's Believer's Voice of Victory. He also, of course, does speaking tours all over the country on off his own back. So in addition to all those other things that you mentioned, he's also just going out on his own. Plus, he's got a YouTube channel. Well, one of the things you mentioned in the article, we know he's a big Christian nationalist, a promoter of Christian nationalism. What about this Black Robe Regiment? He created this organization. What is the Black Robe Regiment and what's that all about? Oh, the Black Robe Regiment was an association of conservative clergy and, quote unquote, concerned patriots. And their Mm -hmm. mission was to quote, restore the American church in her capacity as the body of Christ, ambassadors of Christ, moral teacher of America and world, and overseer of all principalities and governing officials, as was rightfully established long ago. And that is a quote. So as you said, the, you know, creation of this organization chimes with this Christian nationalism, this dominionism, and I heard a lot of that, echoes of that, at the Faith Winds event that I attended in Chantilly, Virginia. One of the traveling pa- um, evangelists who was sort of with, with the group, he, he said, the church is not a cruise ship, the church is a battleship. And I thought that was a really succinct way of, uh, for them to summarize how they view what they're doing. It's a battleship. You know, they're engaged in political battle. And as you said, there's some themes I picked up just reading through your article. Some of the quotes that you referenced from people like Barton and Connolly and others, you know, these themes that run through political evangelicalism today, things like the church being persecuted, um, the loss of religious freedoms, of course, the Christian nationalist piece. And then we're getting into a new territory, this issue of election integrity, the, the Trump's big lie. They're promoting that the values voting or God's biblical economy. Why are those themes so important now? Because especially the election integrity, that's a new development, surely, since the 2020 election. Well, um, I think that's a really interesting question. I think that when you when you go to these events, you can kind of see that there's a repetition of these kinds of themes. There's a kind of back and forth messaging. And what it does is it really serves to unite the movement. And the the movement is actually fairly diverse um, among specific theologies. You know, it's not just evangelicals. It's the movement includes many evangelicals, but it excludes many evangelicals too. It includes representatives of a variety of both Protestant and non-Protestant religion. It includes, I mean, it would be nothing without white-wing Catholics. It includes a lot of Pentecostals and people who adhere to more charismatic forms of the faith. Evangelicalism in America is really diverse, uh, even, you know, so it's, but the move, when you have these sort of constant themes and, and slogans and back and forth repetition, what it serves to do is kind of unite these disparate members into a sort of common political vision. It gives them a common opponent, which I think is very helpful for them uh, to unite their movement. They're always claiming they're in a war with, you know, secularists, atheists, communists, you know, demonic organizations, which is how they describe democratic organizations. There's a lot of dehumanizing language. People who happen to take a more nuanced approach to say the Christian faith, people who are perhaps more uh, Christian progressives or mainline Christians are also, you know, considered to be, you know, the sort of consorts of these demonic organizations. It's like, Yeah. (laughs) Fascinating stuff. Well, going back to that Black Robe Regiment, one of the things you talk about in the article, it's an important development because Barton, he's like obsessed with this idea that these pastors or church leaders back in the Revolutionary War, they tore off, I guess they tore off their black robe, they tore off their collars, they basically picked up a rifle 
and led their congregations into battle against the British. And this becomes a metaphor, I think, for what he sees pastors doing now, maybe not picking up a rifle, but maybe not too far off, because we're seeing things like Tony Perkins of the Family Research Council. He's been forming this alliance with General Boykin, who's another one. It's all about this, you know, stand courageous and, and masculinity, patriarchy, being a warrior and all these kinds of images. That's another development we've seen surely in the last couple of years. That's true. Yeah. I mean, it's a great point. You know, Boykin, as you know, served at the CIA. And in 2003, he was appointed De Deputy Undersecretary for Intelligence and Warfighting. Mm -hmm. He has played a role in, so he had this sort of government history, but he has played a role in uh, nurturing Christian nationalist networks among disaster relief or, um, organizations abroad. He and Perkins have established this men's ministry called Stand Courageous to help men, quote, make commitments that will move men closer to God's good purpose and design, men who will stand courageous. That's a quote. So at Stand Courageous gatherings throughout the country, masculinity, patriarchy, and militism are the name of religion itself. Another quote uh, from their website is, quote, we need men uh, to be men tough with compassionate strength, bent toward justice without compromise, locking arms and standing. We need to be the men God created us to be, warriors for all that is true, right, true, and just. Now that's in their materials. You know, in the pre-Trump era, this kind of military rhetoric was sort of greeted with a shrug and the excuse that it was all just sort of merely rhetoric. I mean, you could, depending on the context in which it appears, it could actually be quite benign. But after January 6th, it has really taken on a different tone. That's right. I was going to bring up that January 6th insurrection because I did an episode on that. It's just been just a little bit over a year ago now. One of the things that struck me right away when we saw the images coming out was the two things, the Christian nationalism, the, the posters, the placards, the prayers in the Capitol, all these things. But then it was the QAnon piece, which has found increasing sort of a home within evangelicalism. It's one of the fastest growing places that QAnon is spreading is in evangelical churches. But then you're also seeing the connection with militia groups like the Proud Boys and the Three Percenters and the, these Oath Keepers and things like that. And these guys are, it's all now part and parcel, it seems like, with this militarism, Christian nationalism, conspiracy theories, Trump's big lie. It's all one big toxic stew, it seems like. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting that you noted that. I think that, you know, January 6th was really the day that this movement broached the surface of a public consciousness in a way. But what we really saw was the tip of the iceberg. And I think that, you know, what the actions that we saw that day, that violent and disgraceful attack, uh, would not have been possible without the role of the Christian nationalist movement, which played you know a part in establishing the necessary preconditions for the kind of coup that Trump attempted the essential preconditions i think more important than money more important than media are really the fact that there were it was the fact that there was a substantial base of supporters who had been primed by this leadership of the movement to embrace the big lie mm -hmm. and without these leaders coordinated efforts to indoctrinate such a base that lie would not have taken hold so that happened in a number of ways. I mean, uh, we heard immediately after, uh, well, I think, frankly, it started at the, uh, in, even before the election, when Trump said uh, during a debate that he might not accept the results of an election he didn't like. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a really astonishing thing for a democratically elected leader to say. It was, there is, it's grotesquely, grotesquely, uh, anti-democratic. It's anti. There's no more anti-American statement than that. It's it's authoritarian. And then even in the run-up to the election, there was a lot of like, oh, you know, if he doesn't win, he's God's candidate. If he doesn't win, it's against God. And then immediately after he lost, you know, I remember researching, you know, what some of these religious right leaders were doing, and and Michelle Bachman was on some Facebook page saying, you know this isn't true. I don't have the quote in front of me. She said something to the effect of, you know, Joe Biden is not our president. He is not. This is, you know, uh, this can't be true. Uh, Eric Metaxas on his radio show went on and interviewed a whole bunch of people, all of whom were pro promoting the lie of the stone, stone election. There were other uh, leaders who were kind of 
saying this, and then some were actually not quite endorsing the lie of the stone election, but they were doing almost as much by saying, well, I think there's some irregularities. They were sort of um, lending their sort of more polite support to the um, the lie, the myth of the, the stone election. So, you know, the, the leadership really um, played an enormous part in priming the base to believe the election was stolen. It was interesting too, because at the time I picked up on a different angle than you picked up on. This you talk about in the article that they're on the horns of a dilemma, aren't they? Because if Trump was God's chosen candidate, the Cyrus, the chaos candidate and all this, then how come he lost? Well, he what he didn't lose, it was stolen from him. What I picked up on was a fascinating p- uh, piece where it was these so-called charismatic new apostolic reformation type prophets who all to a person predicted that Trump was going to win re-election and that God had told them absolutely 100% he was going to win. Then when he didn't win, they were scrambling all over the place because then according to the Bible, as far as the law goes and all that, if a prophet claims to speak for the, the word of God and it doesn't come to pass, that person is by definition a false prophet. So that was a whole nother piece, you know, so you, it's just interesting watching them gyrate right now. That's a really good point. It's, you know, it's absolutely true. You know, Mm -hmm. how do they justify? And I think what all of that did was it made these leaders, if anything, more committed to Trumpist politics than they were prior to the election. Like, so for instance, there's this organization called My Faith Votes. It's another one of these faith-based voter mobilization initiatives. And they launched an initiative called Election Integrity Now. And they issued a prayer guide with a seven point plan asking God to, quote, protect American elections and deliver trustworthy results. So there are all these types of initiatives that popped up all over the place, um, either promoting the lie of the stolen election or promoting, quote unquote, elections integrity, which is pretty much doing the same thing. I mean, it's a euphemism. It's a way to say it. Well, and what these um, a lot of these charismatic so-called prophets did was, like you said, they took refuge in the big lie because they finally turned around and figured out, they said, look, he did win. The fact is our prophecy was correct, but right. it was stolen from him. So therefore, all the more needy, necessary to have election integrity going forward, you see, so that this doesn't happen again. We were actually right all along, you see. that's He did win. It's interesting. Did, I, did you find any of them who said I was wrong? Yeah, there was one guy, and I'm I'm struggling to remember his name, but he got absolutely vilified. He had death threats and all sorts of things. Jeremiah, it it was Jeremiah Johnson. That's who it was. Yeah, he admitted he was wrong, and they turned on him with incredible vitriol. I saw him. I saw this one piece. It was like one of them says he's wrong, and of course, you know, that was the guy that was highlighted. And uh, I I didn't sort of see what. what the consequences of that uh, uh, admission were. Yeah, he got ripped to shreds. When we come back in a minute with the second half of this chat with Catherine Stewart, we're going to pick up on four sort of hallmarks or highlights of this movement that Catherine has identified. And we're going to go through each one in turn and talk about how it sort of works in this far-right, evangelical, militant, patriarchal, toxic evangelical masculinity, MAGA, Trump-loving crowd. It's not just the Republican Party, but the evangelical Christian, the far-right, has become, in this day and age going forward, looking at the 2024 election. In fact, even the midterms are a concern as well, aren't they, if the Republican Party uh, gets the majority again. So there's a lot of things coming up in the pipeline as far as what's going on in politics in America and indeed the world. But I just wanted to tell you what is coming up here in the next little bit here on Mindship Podcast. The next episode that's going to come out is with Rachel Hunt of the Recovering from Religion organization. I've been trying to get some of these other episodes cleared out of the way so you could get to the one with Rachel, but that's a really, really good conversation. I mentioned it before several times now about this chat I had about a month and a half, two months ago now. It's been a while since I talked to Rachel, but She wanted to raise awareness of what the RFR is all about, how you can get involved, whether or not you need support as a person recovering from religion, or if you have recovered in any capacity, you can actually become a part of this organization. Sort of they have a lay counseling arm of their organization, and you can actually be a part of that, supporting other people all around the world 
who are seeking to either recover from religion or get out of their religious background. So there's a lot of stuff that we covered in that chat with Rachel. So that's coming up after this episode with Catherine Stewart. And then as I'm doing this recording now, the uh, 4th of April, we're going to have a chat just tonight on my time here in the UK. I'm talking to my good friend, Frank Schaefer. So that's going to be coming out after the one with Rachel Hunt. So I'm really excited to catch up with Frank. And it's kind of funny because I don't know what's going on this year, but for some reason I have been just catching up with loads of previous guests that I've had on this show. Even Catherine Stewart, I've had her on a couple times. Of course, Frank Schaefer, I've had him on numerous times. Had him on as our MindShift Zoom call. So it's some really, I don't know what's going on there, but it's just really good to kind of circle back around a year or two later and catch up with these people, find out what they're doing what they're researching, kind of like what Catherine Stewart's doing. She's always doing new research and writing on what the Christian right is doing. So this is a really good conversation with her as well. And then just a couple other quick things before we get in the chat with uh, Catherine again. We've got our monthly MindShift Zoom call this time. It's with Dr. David DeAndre on the 24th of this month. And that's really cool to have that coming up because we had him on the show not long ago and he's writing a new book. We touched on it in the podcast about Calvinism, something about tulip, the poisonous flower of Calvinism, something to that effect. So he's going to be dropping in as our guest in the month of April. And how can you access that chat with Dr. David DeAndre? Well, by supporting the show on Patreon, you can gain access to not only that, but to our closed patrons only calls, which we we just had last night. Again, as I'm doing this recording, we had a few people drop in. We had a really good chat for about an hour, just kind of catching up, talking about what's going on in our lives and on the Christian right. We talked about Greg Locke and the book burning that's going on. Just absolutely crazy stuff coming out of his church in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. So just a good way to kind of support each other and touch base with the ex-evangelicals, ex-religious people all over the world. So you can gain access to those uh, by being a Patreon supporter of the show. So let's get on back into the second half of this conversation with Catherine Stewart As we continue to look at this issue of the shock troops of the Christian right, how it all plays out in their support of Trump's big lie, the sort of nexus of biblical patriarchy, toxic evangelical masculinity, and militarism all coming together to form this toxic mess that we're going to be diving back into here in the second half of this chapter. Well, now, it's interesting, too, because you, you kind of look at the strategy of the Republican Party and the Christian right going forward. In your article, you, you talk about four steps, and we're seeing these things literally just ca- being carried out, aren't we? You say step one, what they're doing, they're building an information bubble within which the base may be maintained in a state of fact denial. So right-wing media outlets, misinformation, disinformation, conspiracy theories, what are these groups out there that are spreading this kind of stuff? Oh, I mean, there, there are just too many to name. You start with mm. Fox News, you go to Charlie Kirk stuff. I mean, you know, yeah, it's Turning Point of, USA. Turning Point USA. A lot of stuff is spread um, through social media. There, there are really too many to, to name. Um, there's this sort of vast right wing messaging sphere, kind of fact free ecosphere that does a really amazing job of separating people from the facts. And um, frankly, that makes them easier to control and manipulate. Yeah, so that's the first step. Then step two, this base must be conditioned to expect an imminent cataclysmic event that will threaten everything it values. So this is feeding into this apocalypticism, the drumbeat that American Christians are the most persecuted group. So what's this about? This What's this cataclysmic event that they're expecting? Well, you know, by focusing a sense of persecution and resentment, among the rank and file, the movement is basically identifying and promoting grievance and then aiming it at political opponents and outgroups. Now, I think to be clear, the movement draws on a range of pre-existing frustrations, but a portion of this messaging is really about blame. So mm. for example, you know, many Americans feel the economic system is somehow tilted against them, but it's hard to grasp the impact of decades of wage stagnation against the cost of living or grapple with the fact that, say, the top 1% of earners in America now earn nearly a third of the, own nearly a third of the wealth in America, and the bottom half only owns about two and a half percent. I mean, Mm. we have widening economic inequality. I'm not making this up. This is just something that economists have documented very well. 
Um, a lot of it is a consequence of right-wing economic policy, which the religious rights affiliated politicians promote. But it's very hard to grasp that. I mean, it's made people on all ends of the economic spectrum insecure. They feel like, you know, life is harder than it used to be, or they're, they're under threat of losing so much, or they feel like they could lose what they have very easily. So, but they can't really, you know, it's just much harder to take a step back and look at the big picture. The situation in their minds has to be blamed on something that they can see, or at least an image in their minds. So the movement provides them with this easy target. Right, that's, so that's the- That's, that's the, what the that persecution is about. Yeah, so you well, and we know like Trump's Trump's grievance politics. That was a, a lot of his rhetoric was around, you know, you've been screwed over, you've been ripped off, you've been, you know, cheated the Rust Belt states and all that kind of thing, and feeding into that the anger of the base. So that was the second step. Now the third step, you say, is to transfer the perceived source of political legitimacy from democratic processes like election to quote, higher authorities that allegedly represent the true spirit of the nation. And that's what I wondered when you talking about that sort of dominionist piece, because you talk about a minority of the country comes to believe that it has divine providence to rule over the majority. Is that where we're seeing sort of the dominionist angle play out now? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and and they they say you have the you know, you're the rightful rulers, but then they also say that, you know, America is somehow in the grip of these malevolent forces, which they identify variously as secularists, the homosexual agenda, the communist threat or CRT, which they're now using as a catch-all phrase to mean everything they don't like and under the dominion of Satan, they, they insist they need to take America back. So basically what they're doing is in keeping this population in a state of tension engaged in a kind of apocalyptic struggle between absolute good and its opposite. And that's critical to their power. So they, mm -hmm. they get people sort of anxious about what they're losing and, and they feel like they're the rightful rulers, but it's been take, stolen from them and they need mm -hmm. to you know get it back by any means necessary. Yeah. Well, and we saw, what's the guy's name? Madison Cawthorn. He said a few months ago, you know, well, I don't want to have to pick up a rifle to defend this, you know, my beliefs, but I will if I have to sort of thing. You know, and he's another radical, another homeschooling graduate, by the way. Another, uh, you know, he's he's a classic Rushdoonian sort of advocate for a poster boy for all that. But then you say the final step, the fourth step is to do what Trump did starting in 2019, undermine at every opportunity public confidence in the results of the next election so we've kind of touched on this a little bit. This is prime fodder right now. I think that's a big new development, surely, in these Christian right groups is they're act actively promoting the big lie. That's a new thing, surely, isn't it? Yeah, it is a new thing. Mm -hmm. So what happens? This, I guess this is my final question. You say at the end of the piece, okay, they're, they're priming Trump to run in 2024. They're, they're expecting him to win. What if he doesn't win? That's going to be the big one. It will. Listen, I'm not in the business of uh, predicting the future, but um, you don't want to be a prophet. No. <laughs> <laughs> you could just claim that you had a misdirected, you know, truth from God and whitewash it I all. <laughs> I know. But, you know, I don't see the movement really, um, you know, stepping away from this, uh, you know, myth of the big lie. And, and you know, we've seen, unfortunately, statistics that show that a shocking number of Republican voters don't believe the election was fairly decided, and a, a smaller but still very shocking number who believe that it might be legitimate to actually um, take some kind of violent action uh, over this mm -hmm. issue. So it's, it's a disturbing, it's a very disturbing moment. But here's the good news. This movement represents a minority of the country. Um, mm -hmm. Most Americans, religious and non-religious alike, reject the politics of conquest and division that it represents. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing the religious right does very well is develop a pos positive voting culture, like their machinery, all the sort of get out the pastor stuff. All of that serves to, you know, turn people out to vote in disproportionate numbers. And in a country where 40 to 50 percent of people don't bo bother to vote and an additional number have their votes essentially stolen from them through gerrymandering and voter suppression tactics. You don't need a majority of the population to win in election cycles. All you need is a d determined minority. But you know, those of us who sort of reject this agenda, 
need to um, start acting like the majority we are. One thing the religious right does really well is relational organizing. That's all the sort of organizing through churches, uh, voter turnout stuff, initiatives. And um, I would love to see more of that happening among those who reject their agenda. You know, don't just show up to vote yourself. You know, hold your friends and family accountable. Spend time with, you know, folks and, and tell them why vote, their votes matter. Don't pay so much attention to the personal quirks of the front runners. You may like them or dislike them. They may be flawed, but think about um, bigger issues. Like think about policy. Think about the courts. Think about health care. Think about yeah. voting rights. You know, think about uh, think about uh, the legitimacy of democracy itself. As you say, the Republicans, they know they can't win in a, like a fair election. Can't they? The only way they can solve their quandary is by gerrymandering and you know, voter suppression and promoting the big lie and all that. So that's what we're seeing. And now, as you say in the article, the Christian nationalist, the Christian right is all part and parcel of that. It's like I said, it's like a big toxic mess, isn't it? I'm so glad that you're on top of this stuff, though, because <laughs> we need people like you, Catherine, to well, likewise, you know, I mean, there's a investigate lot of, this stuff. A lot of amazing researchers out there, and you've done an incredible job inviting so many of them to your show. Mm. I'm grateful for what you do. Yeah, thank you so much. And I hope you're not part of the Conference on Religious Trauma, I don't think, this year. But are you? Are you presenting this year? No, I am not. I ah. the conference, so <laughs> I'm all about All right. It. Yes, well, there, Janice, our good friend Janice Selby, is doing another one in it's a couple months now. So I'll, I'll pay homage to you because I'm doing a presentation on Christian evangelical involvement in politics. So I'll be quoting from Catherine Stewart's books. I've already put my slideshow together. So thank you for your research. Thank you for your work. Thank you. And yes, we'll definitely keep in touch. Let me know when you've got another article. I would love to discuss it with you anytime. Where can people find you in terms of social media or website presence? Sure. I'm on, well, my Twitter handle is Kath S. Stewart. That's uh, Kath with a K and two mm -hmm. S's, Kath S. Stewart. And my website is katherinestewart.me. And um, and that's, that's it. how they can find it. And of course, yeah. My book is The Power Worshippers Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. It's actually coming out in paperback next month. Uh, no, mm. in two months. So that's very exciting. Yeah, I was going to say, I learned so much from the Good News Club as well, not only because you started off, as we talked about before, in my hometown of Seattle, Washington, where you kind of started in on this story, but I didn't realize the impact of the assault on public schools and you lay it out in the book. So if anyone has not read the Good News Club as well, I cannot recommend that highly enough. So thank you for your work, Catherine. Thank you. And I'll be talking to you again. Take care and keep in touch. Bye. Bye.